Carlos Solis is a professor, developer, and certified Scrum Master with more than 20 years of experience in the industry. He's also the author of A Warrior's Guide to AngularJS. He's an expert on building hybrid mobile applications as well as Node.js, PHP, SQL, and Java. Now, he lives in Santiago, Chile, where he works as a product evangelist for Modio. Hola, Carlos. Hola, Ray. What a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me tell you, I'm a big fan of the show, so I'm really, really happy to, to participate. Your original education was in psychology. How did you get from there to becoming a web developer? When you start learning psychology, one of the most important talents is how to listen to people. Once you develop that, it helps you to create better relations with developers, to create different products. And the most important thing for me, it helps you to think out of the box. I don't have the same background as everyone else. So what about if we try this? Yeah, and I, and I know that you have solid developer skills. So I think it's almost like an added bonus. For somebody who's trying to get into the industry today, would you recommend somebody who maybe doesn't have a technology degree? First of all, I think that different backgrounds are extremely important in a development team. My mentor, a painter, I have um, people that started in biology and ended in technology. Different backgrounds helps to enrich the, the products. When I almost uh, ready for my degree in psychology, I get sick. So I'm a cancer survivor oh, wow. and I spent three years, three years of my life in, in a bed. So mm -hmm. that's kind of boring. So I have to figure out what to learn, what to do during that time. And um, it was in the early times of internet. So basically I teach myself action script and eventually I became certified in action script and wow. eventually I become unemployed <laughs> because of action. <laughs> so, script. Hold on, before, <laughs> before you get too far into that story, yeah. and just because I know we're going to have some people that don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> What is ActionScript? Yeah, the good old days, yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, ActionScript was a language um, on, on technology that we used to work, which is mm -hmm. Flash. That's that's part of the early internet. And it's something similar like JavaScript nowadays. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about um, ActionScript is like eventually it, it just died. Change is the constant here. It never gets stuck with one technology because it will eventually change. Yeah, that's that's so true. And luckily for you, I think ActionScript is very, very similar to JavaScript. It might be inspired oh, yeah. by JavaScript. I, I wonder if you think that anything else special helped you from your psychology experience. The professional you become, it depends on the people that are around you. One thing I, I learned uh, from my early steps was to uh, get surrounded by people that is far better than me. <laughs> Not everybody understands that it's okay for you to be with somebody who is smarter than you and can teach you. You mentioned you had a mentor. I mean, it takes yeah. a lot of humility to accept that there are people who are better than you and find those people because they can they can help you quite a bit. The best developers are humble people because we most of the time are wrong. We have different solutions for the same problems. Maybe our solution is not the best for that specific problem in that specific scenario. And so it's important to have good mentors. One of my mentors was a painter. And one thing I learned is that you can always perfect your craft. That mm -hmm. is uh, maybe the most important value that he gives me. When you code, it's about how to make your team create a better product. That is a social uh, exercise. You know, that's one thing that you really don't learn in school, how to work in a team environment, which I think is oh. so critical because you're sort of avoiding teams most of the time when you're in college. One of the things that you are really <laughs> passionate about and actually good about is this concept of the ag agile methodology. Can you talk a little bit about that and that how that relates to working in teams? Yeah, um, and let me tell you one thing. Um, the mm -hmm. first thing I started working with agile, I just hated it. I hate it with, with <laughs> my guts, but uh, eventually I learned how to make it good, how to get value from your team and how you can create actually great products working as a team. Mm -hmm. And I started to, that grows in me eventually. <laughs> the first uh, contact people have with agile methodologies or Scrum, that kind of things, we don't like change. One thing I didn't like, is like the meetings, so much time wasted. I remember I say that so much time <laughs> wasted. I could be programming, this could be an email, 
But actually, I learned that um, good meetings when you when you do it properly, meetings are important because mm -hmm. if you plan properly, if you um, have that interaction with your coworkers, this way you can think of a better product. The thing that I hate the most was actually the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so interesting. Can you describe what the Agile methodology is? Um, Agile, in a nutshell, it's a way that we can um, interact with products in a progressive way. So we can start with a small product and we can develop better products using experience mm -hmm. and using teamwork. So how would you describe it against like the alternative? Yeah, the old way was uh, usually some kind of waterfalls. It's called waterfalls because uh, once you have one step, you go to the other and the other and the other on different mm -hmm. phases. The problem is if you have all the specs uh, from the very beginning, you don't know the outcome of your product. But using Agile methodologies, we constantly improving. And if it's needed, we can pivot to another way. We're trying to find the problem and fix the issues during the development. And mm -hmm. from the early steps, we try to have a complete product uh, the, to deploy a product and people start using it. So it's very important to keep um, uh, feedback from the users. So you start out by trying to create a complete product, even though it might not be the greatest thing, but something that is maybe no. usable, like right away. And then you iterate and you ask yourself, is what we're doing the right thing? Or, you know, a lot of times you learn something from having developed it that takes you into another direction. Every popular uh, application that we have, uh, that we use nowadays, uh, they usually start with a very simple, basic product, usually an, uh, something called an MVP, a minimal viable product. Uh, most of the products and applications and services that we use, they didn't start in the same way that they are now. And mm. that, is the, that is the results of agile methodology. Mm. That's the way for a successful product to, to follow what your users want. So that concept of pivoting is kind of built into the process. We don't have the perfect answer to anything. Mm -hmm. There's uncertainty. We we don't know what people need. So we start listening. Hey, mm -hmm. do you like this? Oh, okay, you don't. Maybe if we try something different, what about this? And that's the way we can iterate and, and create better products. Usually we have one meeting a day um, just to synchronize with everyone. And usually every couple of weeks we have a planning uh, meeting. And every time we finish that cycle, that is usually a couple of weeks or up to a month. Um, once we have that um, cycle ended, we can think of pivoting, improving, changing. So I'm already nervous when you said a daily meeting. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> like that's scary now. No, I, I yeah. can understand like a few days. I, I was thinking like every other week. What do you do on a daily meeting on, on this sort of uh, structure? Oh, daily meetings are so important. And one thing that I used to hate, but it's important uh, because uh, if you do it properly, it works. So mm -hmm. um, one important thing, for example, in Scrum, we have to keep a track of the time we spend on that, that meeting. So it's just 15 minutes. Mm. It's not like an hour <laughs> in Scrum on a daily meeting. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's the developers. Developers just synchronize and uh, it's just like, OK, I have this problem. Um, do you guys can help me work on that? Yeah, I can do this. Um, and that's it. Do all the developers like talk in that meeting? I mean, how do, what happens yeah. if you get the, the guy trying to tell his uh, story from when he used to play ball in, in high school? And yeah, that's that's the job of, uh, of a role called the Scrum Master. The Scrum Master mm. is the guy that it's like, OK, yeah, nice to hear that. Uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, let's talk about the business here. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so we can keep track of that. Yeah. So you, you're mentioning now something called Scrum. How is that different? Is it a subset of Agile or what exactly is the difference between Agile and Scrum? we have different flavors of Agile. For example, we have extreme programming. In extreme programming, it's important to keep everything tested and um, pair programming, that kind of things. It's the, the way we work on extreme programming. Or things like Kanban, like we don't have the daily meetings. We mm -hmm. don't have that cycles. It's just a board. And mm -hmm. we try to move things on the board, constantly improving the product, but without a cycle. That depends yeah. on, on the way the, the, the product works, on the team, on the organization. But basically, there's an agile well for every organization.
Yeah. So there are different styles of agile. You mentioned Kanban, yes. which I really love. And when you mention extreme programming, I, I'm digging that. Like I want to do some of that, whatever the heck it is. I don't I don't know. Cool. That's how you sell it to developers. You go like, yeah, today we're gonna try tiger programming and you know, you have like uh like in the Kung Fu movies, like the different styles Dream. of Kung Fu. Right. Like I think like with those names like that, I think it's now I'm excited. Yeah. Maybe I, I'll go try some of that. So tell me about change in the industry. What are some of your favorite changes that have happened in the industry? I like changes. You have to keep track of the important voices of the industry. You have to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And for me, the most important change I made is uh, to keep track of everything new. One technique I use, I don't know if you ever heard, is uh, the second brain. There's a book from Tiago Forti, highly recommended. It's about how to keep track of massive information. Hmm. So everyone that works on, on this uh, industry needs to deal with lots and lots of information. Every day we have changes. Uh, every day we have a new framework. Every day we hmm. have a new technology, new languages. So how to keep track of that? I use Notion, for example. Basically what I do is to store information for future me. Mm -hmm. And when things change, I am ready. Great advice, actually. Like establish a system for keeping yeah. up with changes. Like, you know, I subscribe to a lot of newsletters, for example. You know, this show is one of my ways of making sure that I sort of keep up. I do a little bit of news at the beginning. Uh, and then I also use, I, you mentioned Notion, I use Obsidian, which is like a similar product to make right. sure that my life is organized. What's important is for you to kind of keep it in the back of your mind. And if it starts becoming louder and louder, then you need to find out what the interesting Absolutely. thing is. So for example, we've heard a lot about edge functions and things coming back to the server. Server side rendering is becoming like more interesting and important. And you don't have to know like Astro or any of the new frameworks, but you have to know what's happening and understand that at some point, people are gonna want you to know about those things and maybe have a little bit of experience. If you keep notes, it's important to update those notes. Everyone has this hard drive or notebooks that never read. Create one exercise uh, to have a yeah. training, a basic mm -hmm. training on that. That's the only way I handle it. <laughs> Part of the system means trying it out. It, like you said, don't just store the knowledge. Oh, yeah. But you know, the reason I started the show is I wanted to keep track of the things that were happening in the, in the industry, give people an opportunity to have a quick demo that they could build to understand the main concept. Then maybe if you've got some time, once a week, do a little exercise. And so you understand, oh, wow, this new thing is pretty awesome. So I understand that you have some some extensive experience, for example, in mobile development, speaking about translating your knowledge. Do you think that that's still a place where developers can make a living in? I mean, mobile development is not uh, just a niche nowadays. It's mm. everyone works with mobile. It's one of the most important mediums. So uh, right. everyone needs to, to be familiar with that. Uh, if you're a front-end developer, for example, it's to keep track of uh, resolutions, uh, specs, um, mm -hmm. size, uh, that kind of things. Um, what works better on, uh, on mobile devices, performance, that kind of things, it's important. And I think people would be surprised to understand most of the traffic sometimes comes from a mobile. Yeah. So if you're not paying attention to that, that's a really good opportunity. Yeah. And, and you can waste, uh, um, like you said, waste opportunities. Most of the um, users now are checking in, in their mm -hmm. uh, mobile devices. It should be mobile first. I used to work on a, on a company related with financial service, on health services as well. They think, ah, oh, come on, no one will check that on, <laughs> on, on mobile devices. And we checked the logs and it was the most important uh, um, wow. source of traffic. So yeah. now you have a job as the developer advocate. So a lot of people are curious yeah. when they hear that sort of title. What's your day-to-day -day work like? I don't know if you noticed, but uh, it's it's a growing niche. We try to interact with uh, developers. Companies figure out that uh, the people that take decisions are not the big boss, are mm. the developers. When the big boss want to implement a new technology, he will ask developers. So mm. we advocates are the ones that whispering. <laughs> to developers how to work without technology. And if you know how to work without technology and, and know that we can, you can, you can 
create a solid product with us, you can whisper to your boss. That's the role of the developer advocates. We teach them and show them basically how to use our product. I know if we are the proper tool for a specific solution. I have to tell you that I love this job. My background of psychology and mm. the experience I have as as a, as a teacher in here in, in LinkedIn Learning, when I mix that with my front end experience, that converts yeah. into into an advocate. Nowadays, there are so many great opportunities for developers. It's not typing in code all day. There are all these other opportunities, like your job, the developer advocate, where you get to use other skills uh, and still the ability, I think, to communicate with developers. If you're a developer and you have social skills, maybe there's there's room for a, a, another developer advocate. So what would you say is the difference between what a junior developer does? What do senior developers know that junior developers don't? Let me tell you what is not. It's not about knowledge. The new junior developers have a lot of knowledge of different things, but the thing that they lack is perspective and mm. experience. So that's the main difference. When you know, basically for me, the test is if someone, when they start a new project, first thing they suggest is, oh, let's change this and start from scratch. Okay, you're still junior. Uh, <laughs> yeah, usually senior developers know that usually that is not the, better, the best idea. For junior developers, the most important thing they provide is that energy, the, mm. that hunger to eat the world. So it's a good match. I like to have teams with senior and, and junior developers. It works. It's, it's, a, it's a good match. So you did a course uh, for LinkedIn Learning on creating GitHub packages. Tell me a little bit about some of the reasons for creating a GitHub package. For GitHub package, we can impact a lot of people with that. Mm -hmm. And that is my, my focus on that, on that training. Yeah, it's important to create your software packages to distribute, but what if you grow a community around that? Mm. What if you monetize mm. uh, your effort? And what if you create a software that could impact millions and millions of other developers? It's a way to have an impact. I, I really enjoyed that training. Software creators trying to change the world, they can use GitHub packages. I know it sounds ambitious, but it's possible. Every single one of us use already some kind of mm. open source library, uh, some kind of package. And for people that don't like daily meetings, mm -hmm. <laughs> they can start working by themselves yeah. and create that software package that is perfect for everyone. The main goal of that course is to give you the tools to create packages and how to maybe, if you want, make a living using it. You know, the other thing I loved about that course was that it helps you rethink what would this be like if I were making it for everyone? I think that that's quite possibly one of the differences between a senior and a junior developer. Like maybe a junior developer would just think, I just want to make something for myself. I don't care what it looks like. Whereas if you're a senior, you'd be thinking about how do I make this usable by other people? And that makes it a much more compelling reason to build something like a GitHub package. And also keep in mind the people that are using it, uh, the mm -hmm. community around that. You can create documentation. Uh, you can keep track of your tests. Using all the, the, the tools that we have from them, we can create that kind of solid software that we can use in a community that mm -hmm. can improve lives. I, I do believe that software can change life, change mine. So yeah. Releasing a package is going to teach you something that people that just do repos don't necessarily know about the whole structure around a package and putting it on NPM and then making sure that it's on GitHub, you know, potentially turning on some of the monetization features. One thing that I thought was interesting is that you can maybe do packages internally for a company, right? It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be a public package. I work with a company that we use uh, GitHub packages to keep packages private only mm -hmm. for uh, specific developers. It's not uh, um, a public for everyone. So it, it's a common question for junior developers, how they can start working if they don't have experience. Maybe mm -hmm. you can start working on a, on a package and show them. Most people are very appreciative that you've built something that they can find some use in. And I think that experience of, you know, maybe starting to work with others and thinking beyond yourself is one of the things that I thought was super powerful about where that course is coming from. Another course that you worked on was on building monorepos. Another thing that I had found super interesting 
when do you think is the right time to consider going to something like a monorepo? People that works on, on big organizations maybe had this problem. Usually when we have to create different pieces of software that we have to handle on different uh, repositories, and it's a pain, it's absolutely mm. pain. So basically, if we change that uh, pattern to a monorep architecture, we can have all dependencies in just one place. Mm. When I learned that, I start loving again uh, <laughs> my components. I mean, I used to have hundreds, literally hundreds of different components made in Angular. Mm. And when I moved to monorepos, I can keep them synchronized in the same version for all mm. my dependencies, for all my uh, components. Amazing. It's amazing. It's safe. It changed your life. If you're a developer that works with several components, please, please try it. At least try it. Maybe if you're looking for a job, if you show that you know how to build a package and you know how to structure a monorepo and that you understand the concepts, like the reason a monorepo is so powerful and so many companies like Microsoft and you know, Google and other companies, basically, it's like one gargantuan repo where every project is underneath. Think about how when you have a new version of something like Babel that came out and you all of a sudden you have like six or eight projects that you now have to go in and update the module. You have to update it on all of them with a mono repo. You basically update one of those modules in one place, and then all your yeah. projects are up to date. The mono repo might not be the right thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? When is maybe a poly repo something that's better? The most important thing that you have to learn when you try to implement a new tool is every solution have drawbacks. There is no silver bullet. If you're working on large projects, of course, a monorepos is is, mm. is heaven but if you're working on a small uh, project mm -hmm. yeah you will you will try to kill a mosquito with an atomic bomb it's too much <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just to create the configuration for a couple of components it's too much work mm. so maybe for small medium projects is not the best mm -hmm. idea but for the the larger the better in the open source community, we're seeing big companies acquiring open source projects. So Vercel recently acquired Turbo Repo, which is this repo management tool, basically lets you work with mono repos. I know that you use something slightly different. One thing that's been sort of worrying me is, what do you think about these companies uh, that buy smaller open source projects? Do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Where do you stand on that? Maybe it's not a popular opinion, but I think it's a good idea uh, mm -hmm. because in my experience, I noticed that uh, for especially for smaller projects, uh, mm -hmm. when a large company buys it, uh, we can have new tools. For example, we can have better documentation, mm -hmm. um, developer advocates. Usually we have an improvement when big companies buy smaller projects. That depends on the company, on the situation, on the market. But in my experience, I I like when when that happens. Um, Monorepos are not that popular yet. It could improve uh, workflow of several developers, especially for large companies. So I think it's a good idea. I think you bring up an excellent point that it really validates some of these ideas, right? Even though you know we know that huge companies use it, this is important enough that a company like Vercel looks at something like that and says, this is this is going to make it. But that's when I think uh, you were talking about developing the system for understanding what sort of things are going to be important. That's the kind of information that I think would inform you. Hey, listen, monorepos, it's a thing. <laughs> it's not just a, a crazy idea. So what other new technologies are you super excited about that you've heard about recently? Right now, I'm working on a software platform that gives tools for developers to create different micro frontends. Micro frontends are isolated, encapsulated applications that can work together in the same page. For example, we can create a um, small application uh, based on Vue.js that mm -hmm. can handle a form, for example, that can capture your information. And also in the same page, we can have an Angular component uh, mm -hmm. displaying an animation that uh, takes information from an API. I have experience working with sites using View, React, plain JS, and everything just orchestrated in one single application. It's amazing. <laughs> well, that actually brings up an excellent point that people don't understand maybe that in the real world, uh, there's a lot of code that has been written in different things. 
one of the surprising things about going to one of the Angular conferences was how much Angular 1 code still like exists out there. And you see things like Astro that will actually happily take components written in anything uh, and other platforms that kind of do that, that they little, you know, you mentioned web components. Companies are not allowed to move to the next step because they have that legacy code services that use Cobble, that kind of things. But you mentioned financial companies. It would be very of dangerous course. to move money around. I work with financial companies that are trying mm -hmm. to move into the fintech area. Mm -hmm. So they have this legacy code and they want to use it as mm -hmm. uh, just the good parts. Take mm -hmm. the good parts and use it on my fintech. So. Uh, micro frontends can do that. Super exciting. So where can somebody Morning. find you? Yeah, um, usually you can find me on LinkedIn. It's the it's the social network that I'm most uh, active. Yeah, yeah, if you don't know this, actually, this is really interesting that when you go to LinkedIn and LinkedIn Learning, you can actually change the language. If Spanish is your first language, if you're maybe from another country, there's actually courses written in many languages. And right now you have a couple of courses in the English library. You have a lot more that I found were pretty interesting because I'm a native Spanish speaker and love your courses. I want to see you do more <laughs> in English because uh, that's really the primary language that I consume things in. And I'm definitely going to go check out your Spanish stuff. Thank you, Ray. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this interview. <laughs>